Hey folks, welcome to the Dark Horse Podcast live stream number 124, an even number, therefore it couldn't possibly be prime without being two. Who are you? Oh, I am Dr. Brett Weinstein, and you are Dr. Heather Hying. Indeed. And we are here at an odd moment in the week, but doing the job that we usually do, which is trying to unpack at least some of the madness that's in the world and introduce some curious bits that might otherwise escape your notice. So anyway, that is at least the broad brush picture from 30,000 feet. Now we will zoom in to a picture at a more reasonable altitude. Indeed. Uh, so we are, uh, as we mentioned last week, going to be coming at you, to you, uh, from some various moments uh, and maybe even places in the next few weeks. Uh, but before we launch into a little bit of logistics, today we're going to be talking a little bit about the Bahamas. The Bahamas. And uh, the, the biology and geology of the Bahamas, which we were fortunate enough to experience for the first time this last week. And also about... Fortunate enough to experience and unfortunate enough to have to leave. Indeed. Yeah. We were almost hoping to fail those mandatory COVID tests <laughs> on the way back into the country and be forced to stay, except that only one of our wonderful children was with us. So um, that would have uh, that would have put rather a damper on things. I don't know if our marvelous hosts would have loved that either. <laughs> they, they claimed to want it, but I, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine, actually. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the mask mandates being lifted, uh, actually, on, on federal, I think, or maybe it was all transportation, but the federal mandate on, mask, on masks in at least air travel in the U.S. was lifted while we were gone. So we flew down in masks, we flew back without masks, and talk a little bit about that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the, what a couple things happening over in the White House, uh, including some... Uh, some some disinformation czars uh, that are newly oh, appointed. Disinformation czar. It just makes you wonder whether they're for or against. <laughs> yeah. And then if we have time, um, just a couple of, of tidbits from some some scientific findings that are out this week, or I think this week, or at least uh, reported on this week, uh, that, you know, you could probably... I, I challenge you. I challenge any of you to make them political, but these are, these are apolitical scientific findings that just can bring either joy or awe or inspiration or curiosity and not at all make you wonder what planet you can move to because this one is no longer making sense. But somehow they will be polarizing. I, I, I don't yet know how. Depending on the, the creature's mode of sexual reproduction, it will be an offense to one camp or another, whether it's the binaryists or the continuists or... I don't know. Somebody's mm. going to be offended somehow. Sure. Well, yeah. that is... Ah, that is the uh, coin of the realm, I guess, at this point. Right, the coin. Well, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. and in a, even if it isn't the the reproductive mode, it could be the color of the creature. It could be supremely white or not mm -hmm. or something. Or orange, God forbid. Right. It, if it's camouflaged, it could be appropriating a color inappropriately from something else. Yeah, ecosystem appropriation. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> doing their work for them <laughs> that can't be good well you know i think frankly they're often they whoever they are here um are bad enough at their work that uh, we could just help them along a little bit we could help them and they i've still already be no good at I, I have uh, previously ranted about biogeographical appropriation and how those of us not from the the new world shouldn't shouldn't be eating potatoes or tomatoes or quinoa or peppers or oh boy coffee i guess no Does coffee come from here yeah. Chocolate. Um, I have bad news for you, though. Yeah, so. The term, the new world, yeah. it uh, now refers to Mars. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> not going there. Not, you're not doing that? I'm not going to Mars either. Mm. Yep. Uh, too dry. Too dry. Too dry. It makes you see red. Too dry. Although I will say uh, that I finally, after a lot of, of receiving this recommendation from a lot of people, and one wonderful audience member actually sent us or me, I don't remember how it was addressed, uh, the the three books of C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy. And the first one takes place on Mars, and I read it uh, this last week, and it is fantastic. Mm. And in this fantastical, it is fantastic in both meanings of the term, and in this fantastical rendering uh, that C.S. Lewis has of Mars, it is in fact neither dry nor inhospitable uh, nor lifeless. Really? And quite 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 a wonderful book and i'm told that the third book in the trilogy which i'm not to yet uh has many many allegories for our time so yeah. we will we'll come back to you with with that once i get there i'm reading a lot of other things at the same time so it may be a while all right logistics 
Yes. Yes. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, Amazing things just happened in front of us, but no one needs to panic. Yeah. No, and we're not. We're not. We're not tripping. No. No. Not okay. We know of. Um, so this is live stream number one twenty four. I'm just going to walk down some of the upcoming schedule because it's a little weird, um, and say as I said last week or whenever we were here last a week and a half ago uh, that hopefully soon. Uh, within a few months, we're actually going to have a new platform where you can go and see the upcoming schedule and you know other events potentially and you know co community happenings and such. Uh, but for now, it's just us reporting out here. Uh, and next Wednesday is going to be oh oh, we are not going to do a Q and A today after the after the live stream today. And in general, those that happen on non Saturdays, we probably won't do Q and A's just because of the, the vagaries of scheduling. So Well, we can't stop them from having Q's, but we will not be delivering the corresponding A's. The and A part is yeah. uh, is on they us. They might infer them. They might. Which yeah. Would be good. And and, yeah. and I'm sure some of some of the A's will be excellent and, and uh, thought provoking in and of themselves, prompting perhaps more Q's, which is mm. which is the way it should right. go. Right. The Q's just keep on coming. Yeah. Um, okay, so next Wednesday, May 4th, we're going to do our uh, live stream number 125 in the middle of the day, probably around noon Pacific, no Q&A, the following Saturday, May 7th. Then uh, it's going to be a while because we have some travel that is just going to make it impossible for us to do another one until May 26th, Thursday, May 26th. Um, but in that intervening time, there will hopefully be one or two uh, solo hosted guest episodes that are coming out uh, from from you, Brett, that should be really excellent. And there's one or two that are going to come out uh, sooner than that as well, I'm thinking. Yes. Yeah. Um, there is also, I will just say, a possibility of something live happening this weekend. No promises, but uh, keep your eye out if you're interested in such a thing. But having nothing to do with me. You won't be here. No. I, I mean, won't. you'll be live, but we're not going to, we're not going to Zoom call you in. That would be a, a demotion from, you know, being present right here in the room. All right. Um, so then uh, we're going to do a couple Thursday, May 26th, and then Saturday, May 28th, and uh, then for a couple of weeks, continuing on with our Saturdays. So uh, just a weird schedule um, for which we apologize, but there are opportunities, some of which we will talk about as, as they have happened, that are getting in the way of normal scheduling. Yeah, it can't yes. be avoided. Wait. <laughs> I no, thought I, you were going to say something. No, I was just pointing out that it can't be avoided that, um, you know, part of what we do here involves us being involved elsewhere in the world. And when it happens, we go and... Yeah. And frankly, I mean, it's just, it's, it's such a relief to feel things opening up, even as there is a, a sense of dread uh, for those of us who have no way to forget about it. And frankly, it would be better if no one could forget about the fact that we have now in most of the West, or at least um, certainly in Canada and still in the U.S., have, um, and I assume, I actually don't even know what's happening in Australia and New Zealand at this point, um, effectively have a two-tiered society now, uh, where uh, those who can who can prove their cleanliness and exaltedness and closer to godness of having been vaccinated against COVID uh, get all of the get all of the things that were previously understood to be just perks of being a, a human being, largely. Uh, and uh, those of us who are you know, closer to, I don't even know what, the base existence of man and, and, and filthy and presumably uneducated and, and rather dim uh, don't, don't get as many of those things as anymore. As many of those perks. Mm -hmm. And uh, even worse, you and I haven't talked about this, but... Um, it reemerged in in uh, my sphere, at least today, that uh, this question of effectively um, subordinating our sovereignty to the World Health Organization is actually rapidly on the march. And yeah. so in the future, such questions might not even be decided domestically. They might be decided by some other authority, which is, uh, if you think about it, quite terrifying. Indeed it is. Especially when it's the who. Especially when it's an organization with such an appalling track record on exactly this question just now. So, right. you know, if, if we can potentially be willing to hand over sovereignty to an organization that has just failed on exactly this topic, then what what aren't we willing to hand over yes. our sovereignty for? How badly would they have to perform in order for us not to be willing to hand over our sovereignty to them? That's the question, because it really, you know... They, uh, Unfortunately, that sounded to me like a challenge. Yes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yes. fortunately, it may turn out that way. Indeed. Um, 
Okay, so uh, we do encourage you, just logistics again, we encourage you to read our book, Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century, and to join our Patreons, where we have uh, monthly conversations available to patrons of, of various stripes and colors and creeds. Striped patrons. Yes, I think so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was, didn't that, didn't that zebra show up for you one time? Didn't uh, talk much. That was two guys in a zebra suit, but... You didn't tell me how that resolved. That, that was what it turned out it to be. Resolved with them taking off the zebra suit and yeah. participating in the conversation. But yeah, anyway. It's not as interesting as it could have been. But I mean, no. I guess how a zebra gets access to currency, I don't know. Exactly. Pay for access to the. Okay. I guess they use Stripe. Ooh. Yep. It wasn't great. But, no, but you know, I was. Admission was free. Sitting right it there. Was, somebody was, was going to have to. So that joke was not going to make itself, that's for sure. <laughs> they rarely do. <laughs> They really do. Okay, we are uh, we are live right now on YouTube and Odyssey. Chat is happening on Odyssey. We will of course be on um, you know Spotify, Apple uh, Podcasts, all the usual places uh, soon. Soon thereafter, we have some some merchandise at store.darkhorsepodcast.org. We have uh, my natural selections substack, uh, which this week I wrote about some of the biology and geology of the Bahamas. We'll be talking about that some here today. And we have, as has become uh, our want. Mm-hmm. What is a want? What? <laughs> and it's not a, it's, a, it's, I think it's an O, W O N T. See, now you're getting me into the spelling where I have. But no, okay, forget about the no spelling. Oh. No. What, what is it? Um, it's, a, it's, Get, a pre- it's a predilection. A predilection. I think. Yes. I mean, I yes. I guess I wonder I'm about the etymology. I'm pretty sure it's a predilection, but I'm going to yeah. look both words up later. No, I know. I, sure I, I think you're right. Up. I just, uh, I guess I was wondering about the history of the word uh, want with, a, with an O. As is our want. As is our want. I don't think it has an O. You don't think it has an O? Sure As is our, no, I don't think so. Have you, uh, so can, can oh, Zach, can the, uh, can the audience hear you? Yeah. Okay. So now we're just talking at our producer in the other room. That's that's not very good. Very we're good hearing voices, <laughs> and our yes. only defense is that they are actually coming from people. Indeed. Um, as as is our want. So Zach, after we read our ads, you can come back to us with our uh, uh, with the answer on this. Um, Shall we, we pay have, the rent? Well, you're right. Actually, we must pay the rent. Apparently, um, it is want with an O. Want with an O. Uh, but we don't know the etymology. So, um, awesome. And find out if it's related to wanton. That also has an O, doesn't it? No, but it's W A N T O N. It's an oh, O in the See, it does have an O, but it's a whole. It's like Brett Weinstein with two T's, except the second T is in the second word. Yeah. Yeah. It's a rather like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So we have three sponsors this week. We are very grateful for our sponsors. As those who have, uh, who are regular viewers or listeners know, uh, we introduce our sponsors with a with a sound and what's the opposite of introduce, extraduce, <laughs> <laughs> evict. <laughs> no, we do not evict our sponsors. We close out talking, um, doing our ads with another sound. And for those watching, there's always a green border around when we are um, reading our sponsored content. And we do not do ads for any products that we do not actually vouch for. Um, so we reject more sponsors than, um, than we accept. Uh, so you can be sure that if we are reading ads for these, uh, for these guys, we are actually enthusiastic. And without further ado, you're first. Aha, uh-huh. I am uh, reading this having not looked it over. I'm working without Annette, who called in sick for work today. Always. Yes. I don't know what it is with her, but... Okay, our first sponsor this week is Ned, a CBD company that stands out in a highly saturated CBD market. You can buy CBD products in nearly every coffee shop or grocery store, but Ned's blends stand out. This month, they're promoting their Dream Set. Their sleep blend contains CBN, a powerful cannabinoid that promotes sleep, with 750 milligrams of USDA-certified organic CBD from the purest single-source hemp flower extract. And they've added 24% more organic and wild-crafted botanicals than their original formulation. Ned has also created Mellow Magnesium, a powerful daily magnesium supplement with amino acids and trace minerals that propel memory, mood, brain function, stress response, nerve, muscle health, and sleep. These two products, Sleep Blend and Mellow Magnesium with an umlaut, are products specifically developed to optimize your body for sleep and relaxation. 
You're doing great. You're amazed that I came up with the word umlaut while reading that. I know that you are. A, a bit, yeah, I am. As I think you should be. <laughs> uh, all of Ned's full-spectrum hemp oil extracted from USDA certified organic hemp plants grown by an independent farmer named Jonathan in Paonia, Colorado. And on their site, Ned shares third-party lab reports and information about their farmers ex and extraction process. Ned's products are science-backed, nature-based solutions that offer an alternative to prescription and over-the-counter drugs. They are chock full of premium CBD and full spectrum, uh, uh, and a full spectrum of active cannabinoids, terpenes, flavonoids, trichomes, and offer functional support for stress, inflammation, balance, and sleep. We encourage you to try Ned's Dream Set. Dark Horse listeners get 15% off with the code Dark Horse. Go to helloned.com slash darkhorse uh, or enter Dark Horse at checkout. That's helloned, H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D dot com slash Dark Horse to get 15% off. Thank you, Ned, for sponsoring the show and offering our listeners a natural remedy for some of life's most common health issues. Our second sponsor uh, this week is Eight Sleep, a relatively new sponsor for us, and we are excited to know about them and proud to have their support. Good sleep is a game changer. As we discuss in the sleep chapter of Hunter Gatherer's Guide, intelligent life that found its way to Earth might be surprised by a lot of what it found on our planet, but not by the fact of sleep or dreams. Sleep is necessary. Without good sleep, we are destined to be unhealthy and unproductive. Yet more than 30% of Americans struggle with sleep, and frankly, that number sounds low to me. And temperature is one of the main reasons. It's well known that individuals and couples who sleep together often have different optimal sleep temperatures. Eight Sleep allows fine-tuned temperature regulation for both people. Having a cool room and a warm bed is a luxury that Eight Sleep makes easy to obtain. The Pod Pro cover by Eight Sleep is the most advanced solution on the market for thermoregulation. You can add the cover to any mattress, so you don't need to get a whole new mattress, and start sleeping as cool as 55 degrees Fahrenheit or as hot as 110, both of which sound extreme and undesirable but you can go there if you want to. The temperature of the cover will adjust each side of the bed based on your sleep stages, biometrics, and bedroom temperature, reacting dynamically to create the optimal sleeping environment. Eight sleep users fall asleep up to 32% faster, reduce sleep interruptions by 40%, and get more restful sleep overall. And with 30% more deep sleep on average, that restorative sleep will likely help with physical recovery, hormone regulation, and mental clarity. Finally, the alarm feature, which can wake you with temperature change and or slight chest level vibrations, is so much gentler than any standard alarm. We were both a little skeptical and are now totally sold. We are surprised at how much we appreciate this bed. Go to 8sleep.com slash darkhorse to check out the Pod Pro cover and save $150 at checkout. 8 Sleep ships to the US, Canada, and the UK. I'm going to argue that they should stop calling it an alarm feature, that alarm is the bad thing we're trying to avoid. Waking up by being alarmed is bad. It should be the... A wake-up feature. The rouse feature. I'm not actually sure that they call it the alarm feature. Oh. They may. Well, we should stop calling it the alarm feature because... The wake-up feature. Yeah, the wake-up feature. Yeah. And our final sponsor this week is Moink. M-O-I-N-K. 97% of the chickens served in the U.S. are dipped in chlorine. This is because big ag doesn't have the same quality standards as the family farm. An eighth generation farmer founded Moink, that's moo plus oink, so you can help save the family farm and get access to the highest quality meat on earth. Moink delivers grass-fed and grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and wild-cut Alaskan salmon direct to your door. Moink farmers farm like our grandparents did, and as a result, Moink meat tastes like it should, which is to say, delicious. Unlike the supermarket, Moink gives you total control over the quality and source of your food. You choose the meat delivered in your every box, like ribeyes, to chicken breast, to pork chops, to salmon fillets, and much more, and you can cancel any time. I love everything about Moink. The fact that the meat is grass-fed and finished on small farms, the lovely publications that come along with it, and, of course, the meat itself. Shark Tank host Kevin O'Leary called Moink's bacon the best bacon he's ever tasted. I agree. It's amazing. Keep American farming going by signing up at moinkbox.com slash darkhorse right now, and listeners of, of this show receive free filet mignon for a year. That's one year of the best filet mignon you'll ever taste, but for a limited time. Spelled M-O-I-N-K box dot com slash darkhorse. That's moinkbox.com slash darkhorse. Chlorine. Apparently. That's insane. Yep. There is a problem with what they're trying to do, and it would involve using alcohol, not chlorine. But anyway, we digress. Indeed. Um, well, and actually, I mean, that's not too far afield from talking about 
it's going to sound very far afield from talking about the Bahamas, but um, not but not necessarily with regard to uh, the you know the amazing beauty and function in the world and how it is that we have responded to fast growth and high population density with choices that are unnecessarily damaging. You know, we, we, we have real, real limits that we are coming up against with regard to um, habitat degradation and destruction and places where the population is just too dense um, to live as healthily as, as we would want. But there are almost always at least better solutions than the ones that we are engaging in. And, and you were bringing one of these up by suggesting um, that you know, for, for the vast majority of chickens that are not raised uh, with call it integrity uh, and, and more traditional, traditional methods, um, at least an alcohol dip rather than a chlorine dip might do the trick. I actually, I don't know, and I don't know what else that would do to change the, the meat texture, flavor, lastingness, any of it. But it's at least well. I, I mean, I think this, I think this is biologically fairly clear, and I have no doubt that alcohol would be um, more expensive and re- would require tending because, of course, the alcohol well, actually, chlorine might evaporate out too. But um, but this strikes me as a mirror for one of the most horrifying stories of industrial development that I've ever encountered, which my grandfather introduced me to. Um, I don't know. I was probably still in high school. Um, and it was the story of tetraethyl lead and how it ended up in gasoline, which is a real jaw dropper, right? And the the long and short of it is there was a perfectly viable alternative that wasn't patentable. Um, and so they patented tetraethyl lead. They, and its function in gasoline was? To prevent knocking and pinging. Mm-hmm. And knocking and pinging are basically explosions that are out of place and so end up over time distorting the engine. They basically release energy at an inappropriate moment in the compression stroke, and um, that is destructive of the engine, so none of us should want knocking and pinging. You know, it, uh, it is an actual indicator of something that is potentially doing damage to Doing your damage body. to the vehicle, mm-hmm. and is therefore environmentally ba- bad because it means that the engine and maybe the whole vehicle will have to be replaced sooner. So it, it, it is an honest-to-goodness problem, but mm-hmm. tetraethyl lead is an appalling solution to it because, you know, the toxin in tetraethyl lead is lead. It's an element. It doesn't go anywhere in this combustion process. Mm-hmm. And so effectively... They, into the air where right. we breathe it in they and condemned... become dimmer as a result. Right. And, you know, in places like Los Angeles where cars were everywhere and the mountains are shaped just so, it's not like it blows away, so it accumulates in the atmosphere. And there's a credible line of thought that's suggest that this has a lot to do with the crime waves that we may have um, seen at various periods of history. And the fact that no one of any intelligence was produced in Los Angeles in the 1970s. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> we barely avoided that one. But uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's, a, it's an appalling, uh, appalling story. And it involves mm-hmm. all kinds of things like the delusions of the people who were... Um, uh, advancing this terrible solution who went to, you know, demonstrate that it was safe. And there are terrible stories of people dying on the factory floor from mere contact with the stuff. Oof. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's an awful story. But anyway, the, the point is you have various kinds of solutions and then you have a series of perverse incentives. You know, mm-hmm. if alcohol is more expensive than, uh, than bleach, you know, do we expect them to use it? Well, not unless you force it. And from a health perspective, if the harm that comes to you from eating chickens that have been, you know, dipped in bleach uh, is delayed, then how the hell are you ever going to know that the tumor you had or the decrease in your IQ or whatever might befall you from that? Bleach is is your stand in for chlorine here. That's you're you're saying bleach. Yeah. 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 Um, So in any case, uh, the point is the system is built. So that you'll never catch up to the people who made this terrible decision on your behalf. In fact, I only learned today that anybody had made a decision like this on my behalf. And uh, anyway, we need to get better at this. Mm-hmm. Yes, we do. Um, the Bahamas. We were talking about that. Yeah, uh, I you know I I don't have a plan so much. I think you have some photographs um, that you would like to share, but maybe just um, so I will I will link to my the piece that I that I wrote um, on the way back from the Bahamas. So we have we have friends both skillful and generous who invited us down um, to spend six nights on their boat where they are um, where they have been and they're actually headed back home to Florida now. Um, 
for two months or so. Um, our friend Dave Stevens was able to do his work remotely, uh, which is, you know, one of one of the things about modernity, which is really quite remarkable. And of course, we also saw and you know, got introduced to a little bit of the navigation that he was using. Um, so they were <clears throat> he and Madeline, his wife, uh, were were cruising in and they invited us to be with them. And we went down with our 16 year old son, Toby, in the Exumas an island chain in the Bahamas that I'd never heard of before before they invited us. And it's right on the edge of a, a vast, like hundreds of square miles. And I actually couldn't totally figure out how big. I think it may be well over a thousand square miles of incredibly shallow water, like never goes below 30 feet deep and is often less than 10 feet deep. And of course, that's going to change somewhat with the tides. But that means that no boats with a deep draft can can explore these waters at all. And so you have... You have some very, very nice boats, of course, but all with um, shallow drafts. You don't, it's not, you know, there's no cargo boats, there's no shipping lanes. Uh, and for the most part, you don't have, um, you know, re- re- speed boats and other things that you may have come to associate with, you know, really gorgeous Caribbean water, you know, seascapes and landscapes. And so this, this was in many ways a revelation. Being being down in this place, you know, the, the the first night that we were out, uh, we spent on anchor off of Shroud Key, and uh, the Shroud Key has no marina, no um, no no buoys even. I th- I think um, so. You just you know, you have to be skillful enough to get there, um, to know to know the weather enough and know the tides enough and the and the and the soundings. I guess is the is the word for the depths, um, and to to put your anchor down safely and from there you can um you know dive in right off the boat and snorkel or take a skiff in through these uh through these creeks they're yeah they're not really creeks they're informally called creeks but they're basically cracks in these limestone uh outcroppings in which the salt water flows through exactly exactly and they are shroud key in particular is just lined with mangroves and when we heard, when I heard Madeline talking about the mangroves in advance, I, I imagined the mangroves I have known. And mangroves, mangrove is not a lineage. Like mangrove is a strategy that has evolved actually apparently more than 30 times. A strategy for, I'm a plant, I find myself in this really marginal place where most of the water that I have access to is salt water. And even if I can pull water in somehow from the rain that falls from the sky, my roots are still soaked in salt water, what am I going to do? And so there are a lot of different evolutions of the mangrove strategy and i've been i have been in a lot of them as have you we've been in mangrove in madagascar in panama i've been in mangrove in mexico in costa rica i feel like other places oh in in honduras um a lot of places they're always kind of tall and these mangroves are incredibly short and dense and Presumably, this is because of the winds that are coming that occasionally come off the Atlantic in the form of hurricanes and you know lesser winds as well. Uh, but you can you can take a take a small skiff through these through these creeks, which are actually tidal tidal flow, and see green sea turtles and sharks, both nurse sharks and I think we saw another species, but we saw it briefly enough. I'm not totally sure. Rays. Um, fair number of fish, although um, the, the inside the channels there, you don't really have coral, so it's not the abundance of reef fish that we saw um, elsewhere on, on the coral reefs. And it's just an abundance of diversity that is extraordinary. And also when you go someplace else and are on coral reefs, you find the, the number of strategies, the number of, again, lineages of just fish, just fish we're talking about for the moment, that have learned how to make a living off a reef and who do things like specialize on cleaning the insides of other fish's uh, gills or mouths. And there are some scientists still who are saying, yeah, I'm not so sure. It's exactly the kind of symbiosis that we're thinking. Sometimes those bigger fish do, in fact, eat the smaller fish. Um, But they're really, and there are also some cleaner shrimp, dedicated cleaner shrimp, so there's that. There are these Bow Gregories, which are these as juveniles, they're bright blue and yellow, who hang out in abandoned conch shells, live in abandoned conch shells. There are a number of fish who are uh, sequential hermaphrodites. We were observing parrotfish, for instance, which are protogenous hermaphrodites, which means proto first, 
Jin, Jin, uh, female. So they start out as females, and then some of them, if the male dies, the dominant female will turn into a male. And um, in every way, um, both her sex, she will start, she will move from producing eggs to producing sperm. Everything about her will change into a him, um, both anatomically and physiologically, and also behaviorally, the sex role, the gender, if you will. Uh, and there are other there are other lineages that are hermaphroditic as well. And then the thing I learned about parrotfish on this trip, not from watching, but from watching, observing, us talking, and then looking in, I didn't bring it here, um, this fabulous field guide that I brought along with me, which is reef fish behavior for um, uh, Florida, Bahamas, and the Caribbean, I think is what it's called. They claim, and I actually did seek out uh, a paper suggesting that this is this is a claim that is legitimate that much of the sand on caribbean reefs and beaches came out the back end of a parrotfish yeah that parrotfish have these modified teeth that they've turned into beaks they're very hard uh, and they rasp algae off of dead coral and depending on the species and the mood of the parrotfish and they just bang their heads in the dead coral and some of them are neater than others but none of them are particularly neat and they end up just taking in a huge amount of of coral skeleton and uh, apparently something like 75% of the gut content of parrotfish is inorganic material. And they've got specialized anatomical and physiological structures that grind the stuff down. And basically, if you follow a parrotfish, you're they, they're releasing a constant plume of this coral that has now been ground into tiny bits, which is what we call sand. Um, yeah. And my experience up until this trip was that on anything that uh, you would call a coral reef, the sound of parrotfish chomping is mm -hmm. almost constant. And yeah, snap, you, crackle, it, pop. It, it's constant snapping. Mm -hmm. And it was actually kind of rare on this trip. And I'm not sure what to make of it because, of course, we had never been to this place before. So I don't know if the amount of it has dropped or this particular location, which has obviously a huge amount of sand associated with it. Yeah. Um, you know, is just low in relative density of parrotfish. You know, we did see a few, but not many. Um, so anyway, it sort of left me wondering, I mean, clearly given the amount, the volume of sand that we're talking about, we're talking about hundreds of thousands and probably millions of years of accumulated, uh, right. parrotfish droppings are the fine sand on these beautiful Caribbean beaches, Yes, which is a really cool fact. It's amazing. Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting. Um, I, I must say that one thing that I got out of this little adventure that I had not gotten from any previous one. In general, you and I have sought out, you know, the great snorkeling wherever we go, mm -hmm. right? And the great snorkeling tends... Not in the Amazon so much. Right. Um, but uh, it tends to be, you know, a big reef and it's sort of the classic, you know, you drop off the boat or whatever it is and there you are and there's this giant uh, accumulation of coral heads and a huge number of fish and all of that. And in this case, Snorkeling did not seem to be what the people who were there were doing mm -hmm. in any significant numbers. In fact, we were really the people doing the snorkeling enough that other people we spoke to were sort of curious about what we were seeing and where to go and all of that. And so what it did was it revealed what I think is the much more normal distribution of these reefs, which is a coral head here, a coral head there, large expanse of sand between them. And the so, seagrass, yeah. So in any case, it gave, the biologist in me was very excited to get good at figuring out where to go look for the reef fish rather than just be dropped in a place where they're every and, you know. Yeah, it was less like a nature documentary. It was less like it had already been curated or Disney-fied or whatever. And that's not to say that some of the other experiences we have had haven't been extraordinary. Oh, they've been great. Um, but having having to work for it a bit, right? And having to swim for it, and like sometimes swim a fair ways, uh, is th there's also a lot of reward. And just like okay, at some point I'm going to turn around because I've gone a while and there's just nothing but you know sand and seagrass and and yeah. oh. Whoa, whoa, like there's a there's a slope now and here we go. Like here here we happened upon another thriving area of diversity after a long expanse of, of seagrass. Yeah, it's actually it's its own kind of training program for mm -hmm. your mind. How well do you understand what these creatures are doing enough that you can look at a landscape and say, I bet if I go over there, I'll see it. And then sometimes you're right and sometimes you're wrong and your model gets better. But it's a little bit like when we take people into, you know, uh, an intact tropical rainforest and you know everybody's experience is the same when they walk into such a thing which is 
where are the critters? Right. I see it. Where's all the fighting and the sex and the exuberance? What I see is a wall of green I can make no sense of. And the point is you, you do learn to make sense of it, but you learn to make sense of it in some ways that you don't expect. You know, how do you find monkeys? With your ears, you almost always hear them before you see them, mm-hmm. right? And that's... how do you find peccaries? With your nose, <laughs> with your <laughs> you nose. smell them before you see them or hear them, <laughs> right? And then you uh, think carefully about whether you want to confront <laughs> and them. where to stand, right? Yes. Exactly. Um, Not but... so much on reefs. I, I've, I've rarely run into peccaries on reefs. Yes. Yeah. The... For some reason, we did not get <laughs> anywhere near to me. it. But uh, yeah. for some reason, somebody has pigs that tourists go to swim with in the Bahamas and the Exumas. I, I don't get. Yeah, it. that was a, it, it, we actually passed it on one of our yeah. one of our forays actually to get our final COVID test to be allowed to come back into the U.S. And I don't get it. I don't get it either. Hey. And it's domestic pigs. I, I who knows. Whatever it is, it's yep. not kosher. That's my feeling. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I was enjoying the learning how coral reef actually works rather than being dropped into the overwhelming experience and getting a very wrong idea i think mm-hmm. for what the majority of these you know fish and other creatures yeah. are now, do you want to show a few yeah why don't, why don't we show a few things about and, this? and you know I, I i i now realize after all the things you said i picked many of the wrong images no, and videos great. hey zach you want to put up the uh um All right. Well, let's try. How about the image of the tropic bird? So this mm. is a tropic bird, and so as we arrived at um, Shroud at Key. Shroud Key, mm-hmm. our first mooring, there were a group of these tropic birds engaged. And, and Brett is not misspeaking. This is it, this is. Also a tropical bird. We were actually just outside of the tropics. We were yep. at about 24 and a half degrees north, and the tropic line is at 23 and a half. Um, but we were in, you know, this is a subtropical bird, um, but it's called a tropic bird. This individual bird. is hanging out just barely in the subtropics. Yes. But anyway, it's a tropic bird. These are uh, squid specialists. This is one of three species of tropic bird. Wait, what? The squid specialists. I didn't know that. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? I hope I'm speaking correctly about this species. But in any case, the cool thing about this, this demonstrated That's something. That's crazy. Yeah, it's wild. So, Heather, you and I and our family ran into tropic birds the first time on uh, Isla, de, Isla de, de la Plata in Ecuador, mm-hmm. where some guides um, offered us a choice that we could not make heads or tails of, where there were some Nazca boobies on one part of this island, and there were... Uh, what they called tropical birds. Tropical birds. And they asked Do you want us to see we, the tropical birds? We wanted birds? to see the the Nazca boobies or the tropical birds. Nazca boobies being also tropical birds. Right. For those Every of you bird that is there is a tropical bird. So home. we couldn't figure yes. out what they were talking about, but but they seemed like the more exotic, interesting thing would be the tropical birds. So we followed them to see the tropical birds, and it turned out it was tropic birds, which we had never seen before. Mm-hmm. Now I think I believe I have only seen tropic birds twice. Once. In, on that excursion, and then here, as we pulled in to uh, to Shroud Key. Shroud Key, there were a number of them vocally uh, interacting and chasing each other, and yep. it was very dramatic. Mm-hmm. And I immediately, you know, I I have learned painfully as a photographer that if you arrive someplace and suddenly you see some creature and you think, "Wow, while I'm here, I'm going to get pictures of those," you may not see them again. Right. And so anyway, I took the camera out and I started trying to capture it so that at least I wouldn't, you know, walk away without anything. Yeah. And uh, anyway, it's a beautiful, it's beautiful. bird. I think believe this is a female. The yeah. males have an even longer train, yes. which raises really interesting questions about what the sexual selection regime is, that both the males and females are ornamented with this long train, but the males the are person. longer. Yep. Uh, so anyway, there it is. Um Next Let's photograph? see. Next photograph. Yeah. Um, I mean, you could also just have him pop up since you gave our amazing yes. producer. So yep. these photographs, I haven't been through them. I haven't corrected them. This one obviously could use a little correction, but these are some, some turns that Your were... photographs uh, are beautiful. Uh, Sorry for those potential. of you just listening. Yeah, you're just listening. But anyway, here we have a pair of, uh, of turns on a, on a piling, um, one of them descending and landing next to the other. Actually, I got the whole sequence of the landing, and it was pretty comical. But, uh, yeah, it wasn't the most graceful landing I've seen. They're kind of comical birds. Yeah, they're pretty nice, though. It's like a it's like a fancy gull. Yeah, um, totally. 
All right. Now, Zach, can can you show? And I think um, um, I think the... the turns are sister to the gulls. I think I'm pretty sure they're very close. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, oh no! Video. Not this one. Stop that. Apparently That's one's laugh one. last. Uh, Just oh, that no, one's except last. that that one has to be last. <laughs> so um, I will say, well, so so here we go. Here's a, this is a Here. Yeah, so I did this learn a actually there was a, uh, a biologist in residence there and I talked to her about the lionfish and she told me she told me that actually the lionfish they are famously in a place of all over the Caribbean. They are in the Caribbean um, as the result of effectively an academic error. They are um, but also, it was a lab leak. It was a lab leak. It was. <laughs> um, so apparently, yeah. with the help of a hurricane, uh, a colony that was being studied um, had some escapees, and they're now all over the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. And they're it was a, it was. I don't want to cast aspersions here, but you know, University of Florida Gainesville or something, right? That, had, I, I, that I don't know who it was, had, so I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off with that. But but that somewhere in Florida had a colony that they were studying for some reason that and we we did we have not pursued this story beyond what nancy told us um but then a hurricane breached the released, breached the colony and, and you know this is this is one of these terrible things that people do not intuit which is there are some creatures that if they get out they don't survive there are other creatures that'll survive but they don't invade and then there's this third kind of creature that is so well adapted to the habitat that they find themselves in that they actually outcompete the local fauna mm-hmm. and there's no it's not always fauna but there is no good way of dealing with it and the mm-hmm. number of stories where something has gotten out where it shouldn't and uh, has effectively naturalized and then somebody has introduced some other thing to try to get rid of it you know mongoose and or mongooses in hawaii and jamaica things like this and it just never works right mm-hmm. for biological reasons they you know predator and prey cycle or whatever but anyway the point is this um every time we now travel to one of these amazing places 
it is both glorious and an absolute tragedy, mm-hmm. right? And this trip had this sort of bittersweet aspect to it. Not only the lionfish, of which we only saw one, yep. which is pretty good, um, but there was also this thing which we have now seen in so many places, especially in the Caribbean, which is every one of these absolutely spectacular spectacular beaches at least on the ocean side every single one of them is just filled with things that have washed up out of the ocean right and we're talking about you know plastic carboys uh flip-flops i saw medical waste and at some level Mm -hmm. you know i think a it's interesting the people who go to these places including us have the reaction of like oh my goodness I tell you what, I'll bring a trash bag. We'll we'll at least do something, right? Mm-hmm. And it's it's pointless, right? The amount of material washing out of the ocean is so great that there is just no making a dent. But you know, everybody has this reaction of like, oh my god, I can't believe. At least let I'm, me do something, right? I'm looking mm-hmm. at one of the most beautiful vistas I've ever seen, and it's compromised. If I, you know, I in order to take a picture that I want to look at again, I'm going to have to place myself very carefully you know there's a tire there you know whatever it may be and so this is just a classic externality right Mm -hmm. this is an externality Mm -hmm. of the way we live we have chosen materials that are cheap we have chosen to dispose of them in ways that result in them not being captured and dealt with appropriately some of these materials are not permanent they will break apart the plastics are all breaking apart in the sun but unfortunately we now know What they break apart into is microscopic dust, which gets into all of our uh, lungs and into all of the animals. And, you know, things are differentially tolerant of it. But it's a tragedy. We are effectively wrecking the planet. And, you know, because we'd never been to the Bahamas before, we are in no position to compare it to how it was. And this this is one of the questions we were asking each other, right? What did what did this place look like 100 years ago? Right. And we don't know. We don't know. And I don't know. I don't know if that has been recorded. Presumably it has somewhat, but... But the the problem is that where we are in a position to compare, even over relatively short time spans, there is often a horror story hidden, Mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, let's take the trash example. Most of the places that we go are now compromised in this way, but you and I know a few places where this isn't true, right? In the Amazon at, at Tipitini, for example, it is very rare that you encounter anything. I I believe the most prominent example of trash that had come in from the outside world is a piece of dimensional lumber that had lodged in the river, right? Mm -hmm. That's pretty mild at that point. Yeah, you don't, uh, upstream, uh, you know, the source of the rivers in the Andes is not generating trash that is at least that's making it down to the the Rio Tipitini or the Rio Shirapuno or, or the Napo. So, on the one hand, from the point of view of visual indicators, it seems more like it's untouched. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, over the period of time you and I have been going there, which is, you know... At this point, nine years? Nine years, not quite a decade. We have seen certain kinds of animal life disappear, and inexplicably in some cases. It used to be that you could go out at night and you could reliably find caiman in the Tipitini River, mm-hmm. right? You would, and it, there's a trick. You use a headlamp. It's mounted on your head. The animals look at you because you're emitting light, and you can see the shine from their eyes. And it was like, uh, it was relatively easy to find caiman. You could probably find oh, 20 in an hour yep. uh, of boating. Didn't see one last time. That's pretty amazing. That that the uh, didn't see any. I didn't see any. I was looking for them. Um, and I was looking for them, you know, in part I was looking for them as a photographer, looking for, you know, I'd learned from the photo- yeah. photographs I'd taken last time and I wanted a, 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 a redo, right? I wanted mm-hmm. a rematch and just didn't see them, right? Yeah. That's amazing to see a spectacular, it's not like we saw half as many and we were wondering. Yeah. And that's not a, a, that's not a species that we would think of as being particularly fragile. Right. Why should it be? Yeah. Right. It's a crocodilian. It's a right. small crocodilian. It's a small crocodilian. It's pretty yeah. robust. It's not going to be highly sensitive to slight changes in temperature of the river. Probably what it means is that the things that it eats in the river, which are very likely to be fish, have 
crashed, yep. right? And that we don't see that because the river is muddy. We can't see the fish, but yeah. we can see the, the, the caiman. Yeah, the muddy, the muddy, the, the Rio Tipitini, uh, which is a tributary of a tributary of tributary of the Amazon, uh, is what's called a whitewater river. Uh, in in the Amazon basin, of which there are whitewater rivers and blackwater rivers. So whitewater doesn't mean the same thing as like you know having a lot of rapids. Whitewater refers to the amount of silt uh, which is coming basically off of glacial melt. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, the the water is not clear. It is the opposite of the water in the Bahamas, mm -hmm. in fact. And then blackwater rivers um, are very dark um, from the tannins released by um, by leaf fall uh, from from plants. And in fact, just neither here nor there, but uh, where the Rio Negro and the Rio Amazon come together, and um, and then we name we name rivers. I don't actually know that there's an established uh, way that they get named. I assume it's like whatever seems bigger or more important. But anyway, once they come together, the the Negro just gets um, assimilated into the Amazon. But they literally run side by side for a while, and I was lucky enough to be there um, in gosh, two thousand. Three, I guess, um, and the Rio Negro is, as you would expect from the name, a Blackwater River. The Rio Amazon, the Amazon, is a Whitewater River, and they literally, for like a couple of miles in Manaus, uh, the city in Brazil, where uh, where this happens, where the confluence of the Negro and the Amazon happen, they just run side by side. There's nothing separating them but water chemistry and temperature. And then at some point, you realize, oh, it's now it's now just all one color. But it's extraordinary. Aqueous apartheid. I guess. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to put an absolutely obnoxious spin on it. Um, but okay, so the fact is, almost anywhere we go, if we do have any sort of a time series, mm -hmm. we get the same story, which is things are not going in a good direction. They are going so wrong so quickly that even, you know, it doesn't take a human lifespan to see the decline. Right. It takes less than a decade in many of these places. Right. And this happens... Uh, on so many different fronts. Now, I have to say, the thing one always has to be careful about if you're scientifically minded, and if you just simply want to know what the what's happening in the world, mm -hmm. is you've got to correct for the fact that it may be that you've heard horror stories about the world coming apart, and so you're sensitive to the stuff that you can no longer find where you were, mm -hmm. but you're not sensitive to the stuff you can find there now that wasn't there to begin with. Right, and so the idea is, yeah, there's ebb and flow, and maybe the, maybe what you're really seeing is dynamism, and you're just sensitive to the stuff that seems like it's gone, like loss aversion is causing you to misassess. Yep. And there are some stories, you know, when we were kids, bald eagle, that was like a mythical creature. Right. Right. Now we didn't live in a place in in Southern California. Bald eagles would would not have been common. I don't think they would have been present at all. Um, okay. However. Um, they wouldn't have been common up north either. And now we see them all the time. They're really common. Yeah. I mean, it. We, we know where a few areas are just right here within a couple of miles of our home in Portland. Yeah. If you're right. sensitive to them so that, you know, you're assessing every bird that flies over, if you can figure out what it is and you're looking for them, you'll see bald eagles. It's relatively common. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a direct result of our intervention, right, on their behalf. And there are many stories like that. Um, Northern elephant seals were nearly extinct. They're now. What did we do for them? Um, well, we protected their rookery, and I must be a hunting story involved there. It might actually just really be the the, the beach, the rookery, the, the beach. Yeah. Um, otters. Otters actually. Mm -hmm. Otters are sea otters. You're talking about. I'm talking about sea otters. Yeah. Sea otters were hunted. I think the population was below eighty. Yeah. In the I world right. left Pacific mm -hmm. sea otter, mm -hmm. and it rebounded beautifully, and now it's on the decline again. Is it? Yeah. Oh, very much so. Mm -hmm. It's gotten much harder to see. Um, so anyway, these stories. You know, there are some positive stories. There's some mixed stories, but in general, the stories are all negative, mm -hmm. and the degree to which. When you and I started traveling to, you know, the Yucatan, for example, the degree to which you could go to a beach and it wasn't just covered in flotsam and jetsam, you know, it's not that there was none, mm -hmm. right? But uh, it it has changed dramatically. The oceans were noticeably cleaner, and you could tell that by uh, what was flung up out of them onto the coasts. Right, and if yeah. you think about the puzzle that this represents, like let's say, you know, a and that would have been that's thirty years ago. That's when we started traveling. So I would argue people have a right, right? That It's hard to define how the right works, but it's nobody's right 
to rob other people of the ability to emerge onto a beach and have it be natural, mm -hmm. right? It's not your right to throw stuff into the sea somewhere that destroys somebody else's beach. And even people who live in these places, mm -hmm. they don't get the benefit of having their own coastline. You know, they may be impoverished and the one glory of their existence is that they happen to live in a beautiful place. And the point is, even that will be robbed uh, from them. It's, 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 it's a tragic state of affairs. But if you think about what you would have to do, if you just recognized, yeah, actually, we don't have the right to do that to anybody's beaches. Um, that means we have an obligation to control this stuff, mm -hmm. right? Well, then how would you even solve that? Because the question is, you would have to be really good at capturing this stuff everywhere, right? At the point that it was no longer useful, it would have to be captured. And um, the problem is that would jack the price up. And mm -hmm. so the point is, it's far easier to yep. ignore it. It's a and, classic. And some, and some products shouldn't be allowed, just as uh, the uh, the increase in bald eagles and other raptors is, is largely attributable to the um, to the regulation around DDT, yep. uh, right? Because DDT is now understood to thin eggshells and birds at the top of the bird food chain are likely to get the most of it and so bioaccumulate it. Um, there are likely to be other products, not chemical in nature, but you know, physical plastics and such, some kinds of products that actually shouldn't be made. Oh, many, many products that shouldn't be made and many products that should be made out of something else and many products that should have a built-in cycle so that it's made, but it is recaptured, mm -hmm. right? There are a lot of ways to address this, but the problem is people cannot wrap their mind out of, if you take as a given, we don't have the right to lose control of these things and have them emerge on somebody else's beach, right? Then you have to construct the world differently and nobody's up for that level of regulation. And so it doesn't end up happening, which means that we're just living one giant tragedy of the commons. But even worse, mm -hmm. if you think about most people are not lucky enough to have the uh, kind of access to these remote places that we've had. Yes. When people get access, very often they get access in the context of, you know, well, I'd like to go to Mexico and, you know, here's a, here's a resort, mm -hmm. right? And the point is the resort will, of course, for its own selfish reasons, hire local people for presumably too little money to keep the beaches clean of this stuff, which would mm -hmm. falsely give the impression that this is a beautiful tropical beach and not that it is an exceptional beach that's the result of high vigilance, etc. And so people people get the wrong impression. And then because everybody wants to take, nobody wants to, I mean, you know, look, I'm a photographer. I was thinking about the trash this whole trip mm -hmm. and I was thinking I should be documenting this. And there was a part of me that just couldn't bring myself to do it. Mm -hmm. right? I couldn't make myself do it. I didn't want to accept that it was that real. And so I don't have those pictures, mm. right? Even though I, I, I felt obligated to take them, I just, I didn't live up to my obligation. There's something very important here, and this is, this is a theme that we should come back to, uh, but something that I, I think you too, but I certainly used to always spend time in my teaching on around you know, the concept of ecotourism, where ecotourism appeals to people who think that they care about nature and the environment and are making green decisions. And uh, I ended up, you know, quite by accident, sort of in deep with some ecotourism politics as a result of my very first field research, where you know this story, but um, I was we were we were in Costa Rica with four other graduate students and our professor for the summer, and he was basically doing a field course for us for the first five or six weeks, and then we were uh, to do our first research before um, presenting that as part of our qualifying exams to get to the next stage in graduate school. And I went down to Costa Rica with a hypothesis that I had generated in Madagascar around uh, monkeys preferring. Uh, fruit trees that have been cultivated and planted by humans to the wild fruits because monkeys would have similar versions of secondary compounds as we do. I, had pretty, I was pretty pleased with it. I generated it by watching what crowned lemurs in Madagascar prefer tamarind, uh, which is an import from India, uh, to all of the local trees. And I, we were at this little tiny field station in Sarapiqui, not La Selva, the big one, but a little tiny one called Silva Verde. Silva Verde? No, uh, Silva Verde was the name of the ecotourist lodge. Yeah. Uh, it was called Bahuco. Bahuco. El yeah. Bahuco, meaning vine, right? Or liana. Anyway, yeah. um, we were at this field station, which is where we had decided that we would be doing our research, and I just couldn't find the monkeys. Couldn't find the monkeys at all. Uh, they weren't there, and I go out 
you know, every morning, you know, with Don and at Don. Don wasn't with us at the time. Uh, at Don. Also called in sick for work. <laughs> also called in sick for work. Couldn't take the humidity. And um, was out there for many hours every day, slogging through the mud. And never found the monkeys. They were just MIA. But what I did happen upon were some poison dart frogs, which was my introduction to them. I had no previous experience with them. So I was called dart poison frogs. And it included a species that wasn't supposed to be there that I didn't know that at first, but I started talking to you, know, you and the other graduate students and our professor, and it became clear, like there's this one species I'm seeing, uh, what was then called Dendrobates auratus, it's still auratus, uh, which is a big black and green job, uh, which was you know, much larger than the native Pomelio, uh, or blue jeans frog with bright blue legs and a red back and sort of a, um, and some dark, dark um, arms. Uh, auratus, as it turns out, had been introduced by this local ecotourist lodge. Why? Why would a place that is trying to attract tourists, mostly gringos from the US, to come and supposedly enjoy intact, undisturbed, lowland tropical rainforest, also known as jungle in Costa Rica, why would they introduce a species of frog? And they didn't introduce it from very far away. They introduced it from, I think, the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua, if memory serves. Um, but it was bigger, it was brighter, a little easier to see than the native congener, than the native close relative. And you bring in a bigger version of the organism that's already there and maybe it would work out. In this case, it didn't though. And so my very first research ended up being documenting the way in which Aratus, the introduced by a supposed ecotourist lodge species, was actually driving extinct, locally extinct, uh, Pamelia, the blue jeans frog. And you know, for why? For why, who, you know, who, who wins as a result of that? A few American tourists, presumably, who had no idea what had been done on their behalf, presumably wouldn't have signed off, for it, off on it if they had known, got access to another photo opportunity that they might not have had and saw a frog in a place that it had no business being. And that frog was responsible for driving a local species extinct. Okay, let's be, let's be a little bit, um, let's be fair about this. There's a lot of stuff so I agree with you. It's a, it's a tragedy that Aratus was introduced in Serapiki. Um, for one thing, we know exactly what it is that it drives out, right? It's a direct right. competitor for Pamelio, and mm -hmm. um, that makes it a, an obvious tragedy. If we take the situation on San Juan Island, mm -hmm. on San Juan Island, uh, San Juan Island has a couple of hazards to navigation that have lighthouses on them. Back before these were inhabited islands, the lighthouse keeper needed to tend the lighthouse in order that ships didn't get wrecked. In order to feed the lighthouse keeper, rabbits were released. This is a brilliant strategy if you think about it. You release rabbits and you hunt them as needed. Um, and the rabbits got out of They stay fresh control. that way. <laughs> they do stay fresh that way. Rabbits got out of control, predictably enough. So foxes were brought in, right? Now the foxes are an utterly delightful feature of this landscape. And it's not obvious to me um, that the net impact of that sequence was terrible, right? It may be that the things, A, these were islands, they may have actually had empty niches because dispersal prevents certain things from getting to the island. So it may be that there's no huge downside in terms of some creature that was eliminated by either the rabbits or the foxes. I've never heard the analysis of what the rabbits displaced. Right. I, I don't know the answer. I don't know that it is known or if, if in fact it's possible they did not displace. Right. They anything. may not have. Yes. Right. There are just simply things missing from mm -hmm. these islands, which we know because even the islands don't have the same stuff on them. They have a, a grab bag of different critters. So just you didn't specify, although many people will be familiar, San Juan Island is the eponymous island in the San Juan Archipelago, which is in the far northwest West corner of the continental of the lower 48 United, United States, part of the same archipelago that it in, continues into Canada, which are called the Gulf Islands, and which also includes the massive island that is Vancouver Island. Right. Um, and they are a lovely place, and I think foxes are only on San Juan Island. Um, I believe that's right. But in any case, the point is, you can be damn sure, biologically speaking, at least on the mainland, if you introduce a critter, it comes at a cost to other critters. It may drive them to extinction. It may compete with them in some way that uh, reduces, you know, reduces their niche size. It's not always a tragedy, but you're rolling the dice every time you do that. Mm -hmm. um, 
And the problem is that many things that seem very normal, even some things that we now worry will go extinct, came that way, mm -hmm. right? Like our honeybees. Our honeybees are Asian, right? They're not supposed to be here. Um, they're now so thoroughly naturalized and so long ago that we they're treat Asian? them. They're Asian? Yeah, Asian honeybees. In fact, I didn't tell you this. I, I wish I had the video handy. In fact, I may send it to Zach and see if he'll, he can show it. I was... <laughs> um, our, our cars got absolutely devastated by the pollen that came off the trees uh, in the last few weeks. And I took the car to the car wash. Yes. And as I got out of the car wash, I was at the intersection just leaving. And the honeybee, I think they were honeybees, were swarming thousands of them. I've never seen anything like it. Really? And with no explanation. I think it must have been somebody's hive had escaped. I've heard that this happens if you raise honeybees that a, a swarm can take off on you. And it can go somewhere. Um, but anyway, it was a very... I was glad the windows were up. <laughs> None of this makes any None sense. Of this make, uh, but I can prove it because it well, was... You, you, could, you could prove that you found yourself in a swarm of honeybees yes. in, the, yeah, in late April I, in I Portland. can't prove the rest of it, but yeah. uh, I can prove that much. Um, say what? It was above, above Interstate 5. I'm not sure why that's... Relevant. So, I, are you sure we want to be doing this right now? Well, or I don't know. Probably not. But okay. uh, uh, anyway, so let's 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 finish out this theme. The, the the point really is this is a beautiful planet, full mm -hmm. of the most glorious stuff. And I don't care if you think Mars is a good idea. I don't care if you think we're gonna, you know, cross the galaxy and find cool, amazing other places. This is always going to be our best bet. And it ain't forever. Humanity will ultimately go extinct and the planet will ultimately fail. But it is so insane to allow a planet that is this marvelous to be degraded so rapidly that an individual can detect it over the course of a small fraction of their life. That is an amazing rate of devastation. Indeed. And, um, you know, it can't be defended. And I, I, guess, I, I guess I feel like you know, because we are in the fraction, the small fraction of people who are lucky enough to be able to go to some of these places that we have some uh, rather profound obligation to convey both the marvelousness of it and the tragedy so that, uh, you know, both can be seen in parallax. Indeed. I agree. Um, I'm just going to finish with one sentence from this paper, Yarlett et al. 2021, called Quantifying Production Rates and Size Fractions of Parrotfish-Derived Sediment, a Key Functional Role on Maldivian Coral Reefs. So this is not the Caribbean. The Maldives are in the Indian Ocean, south of India. Um, but this, this, yes, it's in science language, but uh, this struck me because one of the things that we were doing, one of the things that I wrote about in my substack this week was really trying to figure out, like, where are these islands from? Like, what, what made these islands, yeah. right? And so these authors, Yarlett et al., in the journal, <clears throat> excuse me, in the journal Ecology and Evolution, write, reef sediment production can result from physical, mechanical disturbance by waves and storms, and chemical, ooid formation, as well as biological, scraping, excavating, etching, boring, and endogenous production by reef organisms, processes. Hmm. That's just a perfect encapsulation. So we got physical, chemical, and biological methods by which landform is created in these low-lying islands um, and uh, reef sediment production in particular. And the, you know, I, I doubt this is an actually complete, complete list, but it's it's a really nice categorization scheme. And yep. it's sort of the the kind of kind of way of thinking about it that we were trying to derive from our own heads while we were down there. And uh, I decided not to pursue anything in the literature until after I'd published this thing um, on Substack, basically to demonstrate like, look, you can, you can end up knowing a lot and you may not end up knowing everything that humans know if you rely on your own brain and the brains of others and you don't Google it, but you will end up being better equipped to try to figure things out in the future if you try to figure it out for yourself or with other people as opposed to using your fingers to uh, to Google it. Yeah, and in fact, this, this particular um, archipelago... Is in, a, the Exumas in Bahamas. The Exumas in, in particular mm -hmm. um, is a marvelous example of just uh, 
how complex these explanations are because even mm -hmm. just a brief snapshot as soon as you realize that the sand um, isn't really rock right the sand is coral skeleton ground up by fish in pursuit of algae and the sand moves around based on the currents and therefore it can accumulate in places and where it accumulates and it can become shallow enough you have these plants that are basically putting a toe in the water and they're marching they're accumulating they're basically the mangroves. yeah they're mm -hmm. they're stabilizing this biotic mm -hmm mineral sediment yeah and the roots trap the mangrove roots trap the sediment right Absolutely. and so you know you can sort of see how the whole thing is sort of growing and moving and mm -hmm. it's only because our lives are so short that you don't really intuit that it's a little like and that a, and that's the shorter term processes right like you go right. back hundreds of millions of years and you've got the accumulation of all you know the, the skeletons of all the shelled organisms and the corals into limestone right which is you know it's it's compressed dead stuff yep yeah, and uh, yeah, so you have basically some sort of fractal, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe it isn't really fractal because the point is the longer... Somewhat different processes. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, so you get some scale dependence, um, but nonetheless, yep. you do get a very different sense. It's not like, uh, you know, and then God made the rocks, and then he made the critters, and the critters sit on the rocks, and they right. make some soil. No, that's yeah. not, you know, they're making the landforms. No, and I think that was actually one of the one of the revelations I had down there, where I was, you know, we were walking around, and I'm going like, they're so low-lying. And I feel like I know from past knowledge that much of the many of the Caribbean islands are volcanic, but man, do these not feel volcanic. And as it turns out, I think I'm, I'm right. Not, like it's, yeah. it's, it's not volcanism that formed these. It's some, you know, much more ancient tectonic stuff added to an ongoing process right up until today and tomorrow and the next day with regard to, you know, sediment trapping by mangroves and um, ancient things uh, being with pressure and time being turned into limestone and sandstones and and parrotfish <laughs> scraping algae off coral and pooping it out of sand. Yep. Extraordinary. It is really marvelous. Yeah. Uh, so while we were down there, the mask mandates lifted. For, for transportation. And we flew down in masks. And when we came back to the airport last Saturday in the Bahamas, the airport in the Bahamas was still saying masks required. Like, oh, okay, well, that's unfortunate. Uh, and we, um, as I was ahead of you guys on the jetway, that's the word for it, right? The jetway is the I walk. Think it is yeah, the on the jetway, and there was space between me and the people in front of me, so I was sort of all alone, like walking down the jetway, and there was a stewardess ahead of me without a mask on. And we haven't traveled much in the last two years. We've traveled some, and I haven't seen anyone without a mask on a plane in forever. And the people. It looked like the people who were just disappearing around the corner in front of me, who I didn't get a good look at, still had their masks on. I hadn't taken them off. But as I got closer to her, I sort of did, like, can I take this off? And she just beamed. She was so happy. She said, yes, take it off. We are free. We could do this. And I was like, awesome. Like, you know, we, we got someone who's actually really enthusiastic about this. And on a different flight, uh, we had we had someone who wasn't enthusiastic about it. And, you know, they made a point of saying, basically, don't judge you know, you're allowed to judge when everyone has to wear them, but now that you don't have to wear them, don't judge. Everyone has their own decisions to make. Like, fine, I guess. But uh, I will say that I ran into, I ran into because I looked for it, this piece. That's wrong. Hold on, Zach. Don't don't do this yet. Um, um, this piece. Yes. Now you can show uh, in Washington Post. The headline for which is Justice Department to appeal mask mandate ruling if CDC says it's needed. The department said it would defer to the CDC's assessment of health conditions before filing any appeal. So if I may have my screen back here. There's a line in this article that is, the abrupt end of the mandate left little time for airports, federal agencies such as the Transportation Security Administration, which was charged with enforcing the mandate, and transit systems to prepare. And my first response was, are you kidding me? Like, little time to prepare for the lifting of a mandate? People can just take off their masks and that's not so yeah, hard. stop mandating stop it. Stop mandating it, right? That? And then, you know, a couple paragraphs into the piece, they're talking about signage. 
I'm like, okay, sure. They're going to have to change up the signage again. Like first off, just invest in a bunch of removable stickers that say, you know, masks optional, just slap them on all the signs, but whatever. I'm glad I'm not in charge of this. Um, but I, okay. Signage is kind of an issue, but seriously, that's the best argument they're coming up with. Well, but this happened so fast, but then as we're, so we ended up with a layover in Dallas, uh, and, get off the plane in Dallas and no one's wearing masks, of course, in the Dallas airport, but there's still all the signs are up. Still all the signs are up that say masks are mandatory and no one's wearing masks because they don't have to, because the signs are out of date. And the happy thought that I had, which may be exactly why, you know, WAPO on behalf of the Transportation Security Administration and airports and federal agencies and all are concerned here, is that people walking around in open defiance of the signage, because they actually know that the signage is out of date, may make them more ash negative, may make them more likely to say, hey, you know what, actually, I don't need to comply. This isn't, uh, compliance is last week's news. And now that I've seen what not compliance looks like, maybe I'm more likely to resist bad orders going forward. Yeah, uh, it's, it, it, that is a kind of a happy thought. On the mm -hmm. other hand, uh, the whole point is we've got captured governance, right? What it wants us to do, I don't want us to do, right? It, it, it's <laughs> right. up to something, and yeah. I don't want to comply. On the other hand, I don't want a world of people who are not compliant. I want us to have, you know, really high-quality, light-handed regulation, no more than is necessary to accomplish the job, and done in a way that it is you know, interferes as little as possible with freedoms mm -hmm. of really any kind to leave people as free to do what they would choose to do as possible, right? That's the ideal, which means that at the point that you have a non-captured government, you don't want people instinctively thinking, whatever it wants me to do, I want to do the opposite. You want That's people right. thinking, oh, that makes sense. I'm actually reminded, um, maybe summer of 2020, maybe a little later than that, I was in a <clears throat> text conversation with a friend of ours from grad school who's been living in Sweden for a very long time. And at that point, a lot of people were like, what is Sweden doing? What is going on there? And then as it turns out, Sweden had, a, had an effective approach. And I asked our friend, like, what kind of what were they thinking? Like it didn't early on when the, you know, the US and the, the rest of the weird world uh, were, were putting really strict uh, strict requirements in place for people. Sweden was doing quite the opposite. And it seemed really not what most people who have, at least like me, like a cartoon version of what Sweden might do in their head, seemed like the last thing I would have expected them to do. And she said, our friend Jen said, well, uh, the, the people of Sweden in, in her experience actually really do have a good relationship with their government because the government does not hand down dictates very often. And the government doesn't do that very often, such that the goodwill of the people is so intact that if they ever find that they have to, there will be, Jennifer's um, position was, nearly 100% um, re positive response. Like, okay, if the government is actually telling us now that we have to do this, then, then we should do this. But that's because they reserve it, that they don't, they, they, don't act quickly, they don't act stupidly, and sure there will be mistakes, but they err on the side of not imposing restrictions and lockdowns and, and such on people. They, they prefer that error, which preserves the goodwill of the people and the relationship between the people and the government to the opposite error, which is what most of the rest of the weird world engaged in. Yeah, it's sort of a second order value right that we you know we we think in terms of preventing disease or failing to prevent disease or right. you know things like that but there's this other question which is the integrity of the system that is trying to protect you from disease that is actually fundamental mm -hmm. and you ought to move very cautiously so as to not burn its credibility which is what they've now done in multiple directions by flip-flopping on everything as you know frankly people like us have embarrassed them into acknowledging things or courts have forced them right. to lift you know mandates they apparently did not have the authority to impose yep but you know if, if we can connect these two things we've got an authoritarian force that wants to mandate all kinds of things it has no business mandating and in many cases that 
you know, even somebody with a passing knowledge of the facts can tell don't make any sense, mm -hmm. right? A mask mandate. Well, if you mandated N95 masks, then maybe your mandate is about something epidemiological. But if your point is cover your mouth with a cloth or whatever, we now know that that doesn't make any sense, right? Mm -hmm. Your mandate is not about epidemiology. It's about symbolism. So that's a, a horrifying abuse of authority. But we need something with authority, something mm -hmm. that actually gives a damn yep. to, frankly, engage in the treaty making and the alteration of the processes that we have in order that, you know, our grandchildren can actually emerge onto a beach and not see a sea of flotsam, right? right. That, so the point is the authority, it's not like the need for it has gone anywhere, but it's mm -hmm. just being used for all the wrong things. Indeed. Um. Actually, I think that's a decent segue, although it won't sound like it immediately, uh, to talking about a couple things that have happened in the White House of late. So let me just start with, this is from actually a couple weeks ago. Zach, were you able to pull up the video from uh, the, the tweet that I sent you? Uh, okay. You want to show this? It's just about 50 seconds or so. Okay. So this is Jen Psaki. Um, uh, here we go. This is Jen Psaki spinning wildly. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's fine. Um, I, I have the quote. That's, it's fine. No, we're good. Um, so this is just a little snippet of CNN footage from a few weeks ago. I don't, I think it's early April. Uh, and the relevant quotation from her is, every major medical organization agrees that gender affirming healthcare for transgender kids is the best practice and potentially life-saving. Wow. Holy moly. Holy moly. Um, that's not true. No. It may be true that every major medical organization has stated that this is the case. Right. But then every major medical organization is wrong. Wrong. And um, we ought, at this moment of all moments in history, be able to say, huh, have there been any other instances where every major medical organization has been wrong, giving advice that was dangerous and ridiculous and alarmist and terrible for huge swaths of society, if not the entire society? Yeah, let's think. Let's think. Let's think. Um, possibly at this moment, as horrifying as this is, and this is why you know the happy thought from the, the, the signage in the airports is maybe people will become more ash negative, maybe people will become less compliant, is at this moment... The authorities are so bad at what we have been told they're trying to do, or maybe they're very, very good at what they're actually trying to do, and that seems kind of more likely, that if every major medical organization is agreeing about something so patently and obviously wrong, that affirming a child's statement that they are born in the wrong body and therefore you should allow them to do anything that's down that path, these incredibly invasive fertility killing, soul killing interventions that are totally modern and have nothing to do with the very few trans people that have existed throughout history. Well, if every major medical organization is advising that, then really, why are we listening to them on anything? Yeah. I mean, why, why are we listening to them on any subject whatsoever if that is if what Pisaki said is true and that they all say, yes, affirmative therapy, affirmative care, whatever the language is. Affirmative just means you say yes when your child claims X. Anything? Really? He's a turtle? He's Spider-Man? Really? No. Yeah, no. And were there any reality to this whatsoever, right? The fact that that is not what every medical organization would have said 10 years ago yeah. and five years ago or it's five so years fast ago. right it's crazy okay there are times when suddenly we all wake up to some reality that's so well demonstrated and important that it you know it spreads horizontally across society and we all come to the realization you know that uh, this is caused by that or whatever mm -hmm. okay if that was what happened then there would be a result somewhere that we could all scrutinize and we could talk about it here on the dark horse podcast and you would be able to hear us evaluate whether this result actually you know whether the experiment was well structured whether or not the statistics reflect the actual result that's uh you know portrayed in in the title and all but the point is there is nothing this is just it's a contagious belief 
that has apparently apparently contagious belief is now what medical advice is based on, mm-hmm. right? And that is uh, a jaw-dropping recognition that that is what we are now doing in order to yes. figure out how to treat, you know, yes. geez, who is it again? Children, mm-hmm. right? We're Children. now treating children based on, you know... Who uh, famously live in fantasy scapes. Right, exactly. It was the... Uh, the woke trans activists who made this medical discovery, which was done so compellingly, their experimentation was so rigorous that their conclusion could not be ignored and has now spread into medicine. That's what happened. That's what happened. Lived experience experimentation. <laughs> right. Yep. Except we can't talk about people who transitioned and then realized they didn't want to and transitioned back. That's forbidden. That's somehow transphobic. You're killing them if you do so. <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I guess the point is, look, there's just no, there's no way to take all of the things that would have to be true in order for this to be legitimate and to find them. And in their absence, then the question is, well, then what the hell are we doing? What the hell are we doing? And how can anyone, anyone with a straight face get up in front of the world and say, what you have to do is affirm the child no matter what they say if it has to do with their deep understanding of <clears throat> of sex and whether or not they were born in the wrong body. As many children don't know what it means to be a boy or a girl, right? Like they, right. Like, well, how would you? I mean, of course, infants don't. You know, there's some moment at which it comes to sort of dawn on you. And this is part of the reason that there is such a, kerfuffle is minimizing it but such such an important discussion that is being had around you know sex ed for kindergarten through third graders like no no actually because it's it's too young because children shouldn't be exposed to that then well it's also um sleight of hand in the following sense right now as we've said every time we've talked about this there are trans people mm-hmm we should treat them with respect. They are deserving of respect. It's not an easy easy path to follow. Well, in order to treat them with respect, surely we're going to have to educate the kids that there are such people, right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to say to small children who have no way to calibrate what we're saying, you know, some people are born in the wrong body, mm. right? And children are going to think, I wonder if I was born in the wrong body. A thought that might not have occurred to them otherwise, right? And it's a little bit like if I said, you know, if I took a, a, a three-year-old, five-year-old, a seven-year-old, and I said, you know, some people are colorblind and see the world differently than you do, or maybe you are one of them, right? Then the question is instantly, gee, I wonder if I see the same colors as everyone else, and how would I know? And doesn't that lead to a deep philosophical question? How does one know if my yellow is your yellow, you know? This kind of thing. The point is that questioning is totally normal, Mm -hmm. and what is it spurred by? It's spurred by adults saying weird things to you like, you know, some people are born in the wrong body, right? Which yeah. is just... So anyway, the point is the the thin end of the wedge is mm-hmm. in order to protect some among us who we all agree deserve protection, we have to be sensitive right. to the fact that they exist. So then we're going to tell children that they exist and we're not going to give them a sense of just how rare it is because, of course, if you say it's rare then maybe the lesson of you should treat these people with respect won't stick. So you have to pretend it's very, very common, right? And once you've pretended it's very, very common, the child can't help but wonder. And then you're, you know, you're uh, in some sort of medical malpractice situation if you fail to validate the children, the child wondering one day on the basis of what you told them that they too might be born in the wrong body. No, and I... um... I made this argument here a while back, and then I also wrote about it on my Substack. I'll, I'll put it in the show notes. Um, you know, which error do we prefer to make, right? Which of the two types of errors do we prefer to make? Do we prefer uh, to make sure that no actual trans person has ever been delayed in their ability to transition, which would cause them to be somewhat less good at passing as the opposite sex as an adult? recognizing that trans people are exceedingly rare? Or do we prefer not to allow legions of children to potentially get and actually get fertility-stopping, soul-killing, puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, and in the worst cases, surgery, 
that will change them forever, from which they can never fully come back. Which of these things do we prefer? We prefer zero. It will, will be the you know will be the answer of the unnuanced, uncritical, illogical people on the you know trans activist side. Well, of course we can't have any of these mistakes. Sorry, no. You live in a land of trade offs. There's no escaping them. You have to have one or the other of these errors that you slightly prefer to make. And I know which one I prefer to make. Yeah. I prefer not to put all the children who aren't trans at risk, which is the vast majority of them. Right. And the irony is that you can tell that this is um, part of the epidemic of sophistry mm -hmm. from the fact that we are having to make an argument that is really as basic as, you know what? Being a parent isn't simple, but this is the job, is figuring what is in your child's interest because they can't do it yet. Yeah. They don't know. And it's becoming so much harder for parents. I mean, gosh, the stories I hear from people, and I, I, I don't even, I haven't even responded to everyone at this point, and I just don't even know what to say. But the, but the parents who I hear from who have their children coming to them and declaring that they are the opposite sex, and these are parents who know what's what. And they know their kids and they're not transphobes and they're not bigots and they're not nazis and they're none of those things these are good honest people who love their children deeply and they are fighting against the current that is coming at these children in the schools and in the media and in the everything and in the doctor's office and in the doctor's office from the healthcare professionals from the so-called educators from the so-called healthcare professionals and the so-called educators and from the so-called journalists, yeah, and all of whom are doing a propaganda job, and it's destroying children. And how dare they? Right. And why, you know, let's put it this way. There is a reason that, at least until five minutes ago, and for some of us, continuing right through this very instant, we detest pedophiles, right? There's yes. a reason, and it is because they are a threat to children. They will destroy the lives of children if they are allowed to do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the point is, OK, we have certain rights. Right. If somebody is trying to molest your child, you have actually extraordinary rights to protect that child. Mm -hmm. If the somebody who's trying to destroy your child is a confused teacher or doctor or bureaucrat, you have no such rights, because what they're telling you is that actually we are acting in your child's interest and you've lost track of what it is. Oh, and we may, in fact, Take your parental rights. Right. And, you know, we are marching ever further in that direction. So, uh, again, it's like, look, at what point do you hear yourself trying, struggling to make an argument that actually these people don't have the right to interfere with my child's future fertility, mm -hmm. right? Why, do, why am I even having to make that argument? Why would I ever have to make that argument? Isn't that self-evident? Maybe it's the sophistry. Maybe the sophistry has gotten to this topic, too. Right. You like, think? Right. And so I guess that's what I want is I want just like a an emblem, a flag, something I can hold up at the point that the sophistry has reached the next argument. I don't want to have to argue it again. Mm -hmm. I just want to say, ah, it's happened again. The <laughs> contagion has gotten here as well. Darn. Sophistry foul. Yep. I can't imagine that we're going to solve this in English now because the sophists have arrived. You know, that that sort yep. of thing. Yep. All right. We're going to have to work something up for that. Okay. Uh, you want to talk about um, Elon, Twitter, lefty meltdown, <laughs> Biden administration, <laughs> yeah. Department of Homeland Security. Those are the keywords I have written uh, down here. I'll, I'll try. To, I'll try to streamline a little bit because uh, we're we're pretty deeply into this. We uh, really are. Yeah, it's, uh, it's late now. It's dinner time. Hour. Um, let's just say it has it's been after very dinner time for everyone listening live, unless you're in Hawaii or Australia. It, it, it has been very interesting to watch uh, Elon so far do exactly what he suggested he was going to do Crazy. apparently for the reason that he suggested he was going to do it and to watch uh all of the people on the blue team freak the fuck out about this guy who actually figured out how to put electric cars on the road in a way that we are all encountering them and driving them and charging them and all of the things that we do i mean right it's like how dare he it's not the most Hitlerian move I've ever seen, right? The electric Maybe he's just really thing. bad at it. Yeah. We have to be, be on the lookout for, for Hitlers that are bad at it as well. <laughs> Crypto Hitlers. Um, yeah. And, you know, Hitler wasn't a subtle guy. So no. I, in any case, 
it's very interesting to watch people freak out and project all kinds of things onto this, which, you know, I admit it could just be a business thing, but I really don't think this is just a business thing. I think Elon, who frankly is a user of Twitter, more than most of us, right, actually has innovated his own mechanism. He's pushed the limits of edgelording and whatever it is that he does on Twitter, and he's done it artfully. He actually likes the place, and frankly, I think he's just pissed off on a lot of our behalf and the behalf of many of the departed and, you know, <laughs> by whom I mean Megan Murphy. And um, yep. But anyway, so far, I, I'm enjoying watching Elon do what Elon said Elon was going to do and watch it turn uh, the world inside out. I think that's that's uh, pretty good stuff. But at the same time, you watch the other side on the march, and it's actually quite revealing of what they've been about and what we've you know inferred that they are about from their behavior over the last several years. Right. So we have, you know, uh, the White House making noises about finally doing something about Section 230. Right. You know, as Elon is threatening to create a free speech platform, mm -hmm. the White House is threatening to make platforms responsible for the content that their users put on and things like that's this. Well. So that's an interesting um maneuver. Mm -hmm. And also at the same time, we find the federal government, the Department of Homeland Security, the Biden administration appointing a disinformation czar, mm. right? It's like yeah. they did everything except label it the Ministry for Truth, mm -hmm. right? They did everything. It's the same idea, right? It's it's obviously, in, you know, intended to shape uh, discourse, not to purify it of, of, of incorrect ideas, which is impossible, of course, mm -hmm. but it is clearly designed to police those of us who would dare critique the official narrative, right? And in fact, even their staffing of the thing, right? The person they put in charge, whose name, hey, Zach, could you put up the article I had here? Um, <clears throat> all right, uh, could you put it where we can read it? Yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, scroll down a little bit. All right, so you want to read a couple paragraphs here? You want me to start? Yeah, just to... Okay. Is Team Biden no longer even trying to avoid being a laughingstock? Wait, what am I reading? Who, uh, this is the New York Post. New York Post, okay. Is Team Biden no longer even trying to avoid being a laughingstock? Why did Biden just appoint a champion of the Hunter Biden laptop cover-up to serve as chief of his new Ministry of Truth? Department of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas, probably butchering that name, I apologize, announced that his agency is creating a, quote, disinformation governance board. Given the Biden record, it is unclear whether the new board will be fighting or promulgating disinformation. Nina Jankowitz, the head of the new board, is a Bryn Mawr graduate who worked for the National Democratic Institute, which is heavily funded by the National Endowment for Democracy, which spurred perennial controversy for interfering in foreign elections. All right. So here we have somebody who has... Um, uh, we're back. We're back. Uh, here we have somebody who has um, promulgated actual disinformation, who has advanced the idea that Hunter Biden's laptop was the result of a Rus Russian disinformation campaign um, rather than the result of a drug addict stupidly leaving his laptop at a repair shop and um, its embarrassing and illegal content spilling into the world. Right. So is this person really in a position to tell anybody what is and is not uh, disinformation? What's more? The agency in question, the DHS. The DHS has defined malinformation, which we have mocked here on this very channel, malinformation being things that are based in truth that make you distrust your government, right? Mm -hmm. So do we want or this? Or that are, that are bad for the other messaging of the government. Right. right. It is... Uh, well, and the point is it's terrorism. Malinformation, that mm -hmm. is, things that are based in truth that cause you to distrust your government, that is a form of terrorism, according to the DHS, which has now this new disinformation uh, controlling branch headed by this person who has promoted uh, at least uh, <clears throat> incorrect ideas. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, um, during the election, uh the, uh, I presidential election of 2020. The 2020 presidential election. Okay. Um, I actually was very concerned about Hunter Biden's laptop, and I was very concerned about Twitter um, throwing uh, the New York uh, the New York Post off for uh, for reporting on the story, mm -hmm. right? A story which turned out to be true in mm -hmm. the end. Um, 
I was also very concerned about the state of mental decline of our president, mm-hmm. right? And our, I was our now president, our our now president, mm-hmm. and I was told on both of these fronts that um, this was some kind of disinformation, right? That we were being manipulated by some force that wanted us to believe that Biden was compromised, both uh, as a matter of corruption and as a matter of mental decline, um, and. You know, it hasn't taken long. And I will remind people, I've been very good at predicting things. One of the things I got really, really, really wrong was I predicted that Biden would not actually take office. And the Mm -hmm. reason I predicted that, as I think I mentioned last week, is that I did not believe that the Democratic Party could be so stupid and so craven as to allow somebody in this obvious state of decline to take this office in which he would have, for example, control over uh, our nuclear arsenal, right? Um, In which he would be, you know, for example, in a position to manage a pandemic, right? The idea of taking somebody who is experiencing obvious senility and putting them in such a role is insane. I didn't think even the Democrats were up to it, and yet apparently they are. and so actually, on that second point, Zach, do you want to put up that uh, video I uh, sent you? Got that video? You want to say some things while he's doing that? Here we go. We're going to seize their yachts, their luxury homes, and other ill-begotten gains of Putin's kleptocracy. Yeah. Kleptocracy and klep... The guys who are the kleptocracies. <laughs> Did you get through it? We're going to seize their yachts, their um, luxury homes, right. and other ill So in that games. video, which you and I could not hear as I was having it played, the president stumbles through a uh, statement about effectively some bluster about going after um, Putin and the other kleptocrats uh, in Russia. Uh, there are m- multiple errors, and he never comes up with the term uh, kleptocracy, or he does come up with it, but can't re- can't figure out that it's the right word to place in the sentence. No this dad is... had it stolen from him. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Um, but, all right. We're stuck in one of two unacceptable worlds. We are either in a world where um, we have a nuclear nation having invaded its neighbor, Right? Um, in which nuclear weapons could be in play, and President Biden, in this confused, compromised state of mental decline, might actually be in charge of whether or not we respond to something that shows up on NORAD's radar with, uh, you know, nuclear retaliation, or maybe something that would show up on their radar would be a mistake, and President Biden would take somebody too seriously who thought it was real. Who knows? The point is, It would be the height of insanity to take a nation with weaponry as ferocious as ours and to put it in the hands of somebody who is obviously, obviously in decline. And my point further would be he's obviously in decline now. Some of us could detect it during the election. We weren't guessing. It was apparent then. And what that means is if we can all see it now, the people who were in charge of his candidacy saw it then, and they allowed this to happen anyway. Mm-hmm. So here are the two worlds we live in. Either that guy in that state is in charge of our nuclear arsenal and also in charge of whether or not to create a ministry of truth, right? Is that who decided to make the ministry of truth? Do we believe that he understands the implications of such a thing? Or here's the other universe we might be living in. Maybe he's not really in charge, right? And maybe, yes, they're losing control of his ability to deliver a long enough speech that he's not an embarrassment to himself and to the country. But then who is in charge, right? Now we've got a question of, has is this a coup, right? Mm-hmm. Is somebody who's actually mentally competent in charge of all the things you would want a mentally competent person to be in charge of? In which case, who is it, right? Accountability, our entire structure, our governmental constitutional structure depends on our knowing who it is, right? It mm-hmm. has to, this, this can't be some unelected nameless person behind the scenes. So transparency is paramount. Right. I guess my point would be neither of these things is the least bit acceptable. And this did not happen by accident. It wasn't invisible. In fact, the very fact that 
his mental decline was not widely, widely discussed on all sides during the election had to do with the intimidation of people who did discuss it. I was one of them. I remember what happened when you talked about it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, do we really want a ministry of truth uh, deciding who gets to say what and uh, acting on the basis that it believes that to say things that are out of step with this mainstream narrative might be terrorism? I mean, this is all sounding quite dystopian, and I don't think one has to be particularly imaginative to see it. I agree. So I guess that means... uh, Even though it is the case that if you were to list all Americans and you were to rank order them in terms of how much I want to see them as president, Kamala Harris would be way down at the bottom of that list. Mm -hmm. Not at the very bottom. No, 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 no. There are people I want to see less than Kamala Harris, but not a lot of them. That's what I'm saying, right? Nonetheless. You've been in downtown Portland lately? (laughs) Because I hear you. (laughs) I hear you. It, it's tough, but here's here's the here's how bad this is. Okay, as much as I do not trust Kamala Harris, yep. right? The fact of having somebody who has lost his mental faculties in a position this important is so dangerous. It's so dangerous that I believe actually the right thing we should all agree on it is she. You know, Kamala Harris, twenty twenty two. That's my point. Twenty twenty two. Yeah. As if it's a campaign? Well, I guess, you know. I think I just lost the plot. I think. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think the point is we have allowed um, maniacs to mismanage our system so badly that the only rational course of action is for Kamala Harris to ascend to the presidency. Hmm. And, um, and I don't, you know, let's put it this way. You don't know on what day the generals are going to wake up the president and say, look, let me explain to you what the situation is. We have 15 minutes to figure out what to do next, Mm -hmm. right? You don't know when that's going to happen. We can't afford any nights in which the president is going to be awoken to answer a question as serious as do we launch nuclear weapons and have it be Joe Biden in his current condition. Well, but I mean, your 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 two worlds question that you began with uh, suggests strongly that we're not living in that world, right? That we're not living in the world in which uh, the current president, by name, is the one who would be asked. Okay, if that's the case, though, then how frightening is it for us to have just discovered that our nuclear arsenal is in the hands of somebody whose name we do not know? Very. I mean. I just don't, you know, Yeah. But I, I guess the point is, if that's true, I'm still for Kamala Harris because actually, you know, the uh, the line of succession goes through her next. And so in order for there to be a nation that makes any sense at all based on the... It art, has to be her no matter how briefly. Right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And hopefully it would be very brief. Yep. Okay. Can we just talk briefly about um, human footprints in giant sloth footprints? I was hoping you would raise this issue. Yeah. Okay, you want to you want to lead? I do want to lead, okay. but I don't know anything about this story, and so I'm not in a good position to do it. Yeah, just two two very very brief. I mean, we're we're closing in on two hours here, and I gotta get on a plane tomorrow, so like we're gonna we're gonna close this up here. Um, two Are you very, wearing your mask on the plane? Yeah, or right now? No, no. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a very fancy mask that you can't see. It's and it's uh, but uh, yeah. No, I'm not wearing my mask. No, I was talking about your snorkeling mask. Oh, on the plane? Yeah. I think that's the way to confront yeah. those mandates, to confuse them. Yeah, totally. It covers my nose and my eyes. Mm-hmm. You didn't say what kind of a mask. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, just two two news stories from science uh, this week. Not uh, You can put on my screen if you like, Zach. Neither of these were uh, published, thank you, in the journal Science, but science does a thing where it sort of, you know, it, it scrapes other scientific journals and finds the stories it finds most interesting. So here we have ancient human playground found inside sloth footprints. Fossilized tracks of a giant ground sloth are stamped with tiny human feet. Whoa. I know. So that's kind of the story. Like that's all. That's all. So wait, wait, wait. Let, let me see if I've got this. So giant ground sloth, which I have to tell you is a creature I've been fascinated with since I was a kid. Yeah. Um, because they used to be, you know, La Brea Tarpets. I grew up right near there and giant ground there. sloth was, yeah, one of the one of the creatures. Yeah. Um, so what I'm confused by is the term fossil. Um, Should be subfossil. 
I'm right? sure pro probably. And I see that I really don't know much. Can you give me my screen back here, Zach? Um, let me see. This is, uh, it's still unpublished work. <clears throat> the slightly newer, the slightly more expansive version um, says 11,500 years ago. So that's sub So that's subfossil, yeah. indeed. So uh, the distinction for those story, of you who are yeah. puzzling over it is um, fossils are mineralized replacements for bone. So if you have a bone that gets buried in some sediment, then over a very long period of time, the actual bone disappears and it is replaced by something in the shape of that bone that is basically rock. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of it's things... Pretty, very similar to what limestone... Oh, maybe not. No, there's not replacement there. Never mind. But uh, in the case of somebody who died 15,000 years ago and fell into a tar pit, there's not been nearly enough time for that replacement. So what you get is actual bone and things like that. Yeah. So in this case, it's, you know, it's neither. It's footprints. But the period of time is short enough that bone would not have been replaced. So. Yeah. But anyway, the, the, the story is here's a little glimpse into the ways that uh, 11,500 years ago in New Mexico, children were playing in the puddles left by the footprints of a giant sloth. Now here is the question. Okay. Were the adults in this child's group morally obligated to help this child transition into a giant ground sloth since apparently the child as it was maneuvering through the footprints, was probably um, imagining that that he had been born into the. Yeah, the I mean, I think this is body. probably the origin of the uh, concept that those are really big shoes to fill. Yeah, and um, and then probably what came up next was well, sloths don't actually wear shoes, as far as we know. No, they yeah. don't. Yeah. Um, but I I think they could pull them off, but not so well because they don't have thumbs. No, they pull them off. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's one. Hello, it's dinner time for Tesla. Um, and the second little bit of, of scientific, apolitical, apolitical science <laughs> we'll story for this week is, and here again, you can just show my screen briefly, Zach, is, is when it comes to scorpions, it's the small ones you need to watch out for. Study confirms Indiana Jones line, bigger scorpions are indeed less deadly. Mm. And this is based on, uh, this does come out of a published piece of research, which uh, so long as that's on my screen, I can't find for you guys. But uh, basically it's, it, says, it, it says what it says it says. Um, and the, the paper is just published called Scorpion Species with Smaller Body Sizes and Narrower Chile Have the Highest Venom Potency, published in the journal Toxins. Uh, Chile being, I had to look this up, pinchers or claws at the end of appendages in arachnids or crustaceans. And this paper has the distinction of beginning in the abstract with the following sentences. The very first sentence in this paper, scorpionism is a global health concern with an estimation of over 1 million annual envenomation cases. Hmm. Scorpionism. Scorpionism. That's not the term I would have thought. Scorpionism. Um, but yes, so as uh, as Indiana Jones apparently said in one of the less popular Indiana Jones movies, uh, it is the smaller ones uh, that deliver the worst, not bite, but sting. And the larger ones are uh, tend to be less dangerous. Any analysis in there about why? Uh, not as far as I saw. I only skimmed the paper that was actually in toxins uh, briefly as I only found it just before we came live here uh, but I did not see that in my in my skimming it's one of those things I'm, I'm going to guess and if I am slandering the authors here I, <laughs> I apologize but this is one of these things where a very provocative empirical result like this will result in very low quality adaptive speculation on the reason, some of which then gets written into the lore as if it was a fact, like, um, you know, uh, baby rattlesnakes are more deadly because they haven't learned to control their venom. Right. Right. Rather than there's a very good ecological reason why a smaller rattlesnake might be more likely to envenomate you. Right. Which I think is far more likely. Um, but anyway, you know, how would you even test that they haven't learned to control it yet? I, I mean, it's not impossible, but it's difficult for sure. You certainly can't use a questionnaire. You can uh, at your own risk. <laughs> you get very, very spotty data. Um, 
No. I don't think it's here. Oh, well. But I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, so th- I'm, I'm just trying to quickly, again, look over the actual paper. But um, but at least on on second quick pass, I don't, I don't see I don't it here. I don't see the adaptive explanation. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, um, maybe that's for the best. Perhaps. But I'll post I'll post this. Um, I, the lead author is in the Venom Systems and Proteomics Lab at National University of Ireland, which I think that's great. Venom Systems and Proteomics Lab. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty pretty awesome. You don't lab. want to cross those people. That'd yeah. be my guess. Yeah, no, very much so. Um, so let me just jump right to the bottom where they're often, if there are going to be any adaptive explanations, it would be there. Um, yeah, it's a lot of. Oh. Not finding it. No. Okay. All right. Well, have we arrived? I think that we have arrived. So we are not going to do a Q&A today. We'll be back here in six days, next Wednesday, midday our time. Uh, so you know, noonish Pacific. And we will also not do a Q&A, but we will be back then four days after that uh, for our normal Saturday. Not this Saturday, but the following Saturday where we will do a Q&A. And in the meantime, look for, there will probably be, probably be a, a guest episode of Dark Horse that comes out before we're back live streaming. I believe there will be a guest episode that will emerge and there may be a live stream. Mm-hmm. Keep your eye out for that. Keep your eye out for that. So maybe without further ado, be good to the ones you love, eat good food, and get outside. Be well, everyone.